from you know 18 to 21, it felt like my entire world was just ending. I really didn't know what else I should be doing um, or creating in that moment. By losing my story, um, I went out into uh, an adventure. So my journey into storytelling begins when I go out uh, to the other end of the planet after selling my first business, which was an indoor skate park. And, and actually, uh, it's pretty ironic, kind of, this was the team that we had at the indoor skate park uh, that I ran. And so unexpectedly, I ended up selling this skate park. And as that transition was going on, I lost my story because at the exact same time as I was selling my first ever business and it kind of like my entire life had been consumed by this idea um, from, you know, 18 to 21, it felt like my entire world was just ending. And, um, and at the same time, I was kind of starting or I was just about to graduate from university. And so I had been in school my entire life. I had kind of always had this path and then my, my career had really been around the skate park and I couldn't have envisioned or I, I didn't see past that point. I really didn't know what else I should be doing um, or creating in that moment. And so by losing my story, um, I went out into uh, an adventure. I, I basically went to the furthest place I could possibly think of on the planet from where I am right now here in Montreal, um, you know, literally sitting in my childhood home, all the way to Australia. And on the way there, I ended up reading this book called NLP for Dummies, which was Neuro Linguistic Programming for Dummies. And it's, it talks about the internal stories that we have, the neuro linguistic stories and pathways that we have in our mind, and how we can reprogram those pathways within ourselves, or potentially help do such within others, to kind of change the narrative or change the meaning behind a narrative that as to why something might be neurologically connected in your mind. So that could be used to fix a trauma, that could be used to um, put you in a, in a really good state. Um, you know, people like Tony Robbins are, are famous for uh, studying this kind of stuff. And it just struck me that as I was, as I was on this massively long flight all the way to Australia, that I should read this book cover to cover and I should invent a new story because I had none at the time. And so I literally went there and started telling people this story of how I was um, a skydiver and I had kind of mastered the, uh, the, the skies and now I was coming to Australia to learn and to do more scuba diving so I can master the seas. And I would literally invent this story and, and put myself in a position where I would, I would be a better listener. Now, before you think I'm some kind of psychopath, uh, I would always tell people at the end after I met them, that, you know, that, oh, by the way, this is this, you know, I told you this fake story and I was part of, you know, I was kind of running this experiment and this is who I actually am. Um, but it was incredible to see just what that enabled within me when it came to storytelling. And so, you know, I spent about five weeks in, in Australia and traveling around and kind of testing, you know, the waters on this, on this new story and, and shifting elements of the story and seeing how different people respond to it. And kind of like when people um, meet somebody new and they're, they're so caught up in like saying their own name and shaking their hand that they forget the other person's name. What was amazing is by doing and having this new story, I was hyper aware. I had this incredible presence that, um, that had heightened in this scenario. And so all of a sudden I go from Australia to my next destination, which was China. And I land in China, I had zero plan. I had no idea what I was going to do. I literally had no hotel book, no hostel, no nothing. Um, and the only thing I had was a lonely planet. And this is, this is, you know, I didn't have a cell phone. I, I had bought my first little camera right before this trip. I had bought this kind of YouTube ready, you know, point and shoot little camera. And as I'm landing in China, um, I'm like, ah, oh, the, let me go to Tiananmen Square, which is, I guess the equivalent of the Eiffel Tower in France, let me go to Tiananmen Square. So I get off and I go to this row of taxis and there's like 40 taxis there because it's China and there's just a billion plus people. Um, and I'm, I'm like, oh, Tiananmen Square. And they're like, huh? And they had no idea what I was talking about. And I'm, and I'm like, Tiananmen Square, Tiananmen Square. And, like, and, and then eventually I pull out my book and I show them it. And all 40 of the taxi drivers, even written Tiananmen Square, couldn't understand 
what the hell I was talking about. So then I, I flip through the book and I end up finding a picture of it and I'm like, oh, and they're like, oh, okay. And then they, they drive me. And I realized in that moment that I entered into a whole other wave of storytelling that essentially stories weren't just audio and the things that you say to people and the response that people hear. When I, when I thought storytelling, I, I tended to think words, I tended to think hearing. But when I realized that all of a sudden storytelling actually came with symbols, that every time I would go to a restaurant in China that I would literally need to like point out to, to symbols or, or, or mime things and, and play a game where I would, I would make sounds and I would do other things that would kind of elicit what I was talking about. That's when I realized the real power of storytelling. I started to notice symbols that were common. Um, you know, a cross uh, meant religion. Uh, certain s symbols meant, or, or an X, a, a different kind of cross meant medical, right? So it was very interesting to learn storytelling from a different perspective. And I started to realize the power of story and that it was going to continuously gain a lot of momentum. I mean, we're talking, this is in 2010, this, this kind of journey that I went on. So this was still the ramp up of Facebook, uh, Twitter, social media, YouTube, all these things had kind of just come out and we were starting to gain ground and, and people were getting really, really hooked onto them. Um, but they were still young. It was still a different time in the world of social media and in the world of storytelling. And so it enabled, um, I just realized that this was a wave, that there was a movement happening around the globe of storytelling and that essentially at the exact same time, technology was catching up point and shoots and DSLR cameras and the equipment was getting to a state in which anybody could be now be a professional. Anybody can out, can go out there and run and gun essentially, it's, you know, an industry term for, for going out there and literally just shooting a bunch of different stuff and, and piecing it together later for YouTube or for social. And I just absolutely knew, I absolutely knew that the, that the world was going to change. I absolutely realized the power that these cameras would yield and that I needed to learn how to storytell. And that became really clear to me when the entire time I was in uh, Australia, I was taking these pictures and, and I, was, I was shooting a couple of little video clips. I was mainly doing photography though. And I realized just how beautiful of an expression that this was, this was creating in me. That everywhere I would go, I was kind of, I was adopting the first ever moments of real nostalgia right, of, of understanding this, that life was kind of passing me by and that if I had a picture or a video to be able to, to capture that moment, then I could relive it, that I could go back to it, that I can be in this position where, um, where I could, where I could build a real memory, a real neurological pathway. And you, you know, I was rewiring and, and creating these back paths in the exact same way that I'd learned neuro-linguistic programming through video. And so I absolutely fell in love with video. And then as I landed in China, China and I was in Tiananmen Square, my camera broke and it just stopped working. And I had all these beautiful memories and, and I, I just, there's only so few pictures of that moment. But what I realized is in that moment, I was the most free I ever was. And, um, and, and that's when I fell in love with, with photo and video. That's when I fell in love with creating content. That's when I realized that my, my life was going to change. And I, I understood the next chapter of what I was going to build as an entrepreneur. When I came back, um, to Montreal after my journeys and I had gone to Europe and all the, all these other places, I literally did the tour of the world. When I came back, um, I realized that one, the first thing I needed to do was buy a laptop and buy a camera because this was something that was going to be incredibly important. And I decided I was going to reverse engineer building a movement. You, you see, for, um, for the three years that I was running the indoor skate park, my goal wasn't just to run a skate park, it was to build a community. It was to build a lounge, a space in my hometown where I could um, gather with my friends and, and not necessarily have it be a bar or club, but really be a space where we can, where we can share each other's stories, where we can listen to one another without having blaring music in the background that's deafening us or, or having to involve alcohol or drugs. Um, and at that time, that, that was a, a big part of my life, right? Uh, smoking a joint and, and being out in, in suburbia where, where I grew up right around here. Um, 
And, and the reason I would do that is because I became socially addicted to storytelling. I became socially addicted to sharing my experience with other people and comparing notes, essentially. Learning through the people that I had encountered, learning through the experiences that I was having. And storytelling, kind of, the art of storytelling become, is really about telling people's stories from their perspective, right? We all have different perspectives. What I believe to be difficult might be incredibly easy to somebody else who's a pro. What I am experiencing here living in Canada is very different than what somebody might be experiencing living in poverty in India. And so I just became fascinated with um, psychology and, and perspective and how these tools can enable me to tell a story from a perspective that uh, is just really exciting. And so I knew nothing about cameras. Um, I knew nothing about um, websites. I knew nothing about social media. In fact, I resisted it. I hated social media, to be honest. I actually got Facebook as I was leaving. Um, it was the first time I kind of like really started to, to jump into this. Um, and I had had it before just to set up the account, but I never really used it. And, and this is where this, almost like the inner poet in me, the inner storyteller in me was just starting to rise up. I, I felt the swell of, of needing to document my life, to, um, to document the process, to tell the hero's journey that I was on. And the truth is I've documented loads and loads and loads. I mean, hundreds of if not, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of footage uh, over the last I guess, decade of my career. And the entire time I was struggling to tell the story because it was never, I was never good enough, right? I kept thinking that I, I needed better equipment or I would watch some of the people that I, that I admire. Um, and I, you know, now I watch some people like Casey Neistat or Peter McKinnon or whoever. Um, and I was always seeing like the gap, the gap between where I am and where I was as a storyteller and where I wanted to be. And I still believe that I'm not that great of a storyteller, but when I really look back or when I really look at the difference between where I was and where I am, if I look at the videos and the quality, not only of the video, um, you know, the, the specs and the pixels of the video and the audio quality of the video, but, but more importantly, the actual storylines behind the videos, my understanding that, you know, we watch a Disney movie even though we know what the ending is. Or we watch you know, some of my favorite movies like James Bond or, or uh, Batman or a hero movie um, and we know what the ending is but it doesn't stop us from watching it. And so stories are how culture is actually passed down. And the act of documenting, and this is the key, documentation is a very interesting component of storytelling. And see, as I was going on this trip, I had, I had decided I was going to watch a documentary a week for 52 weeks straight. And now it's been eight years that I do this. Uh, not always watching documentaries at this point, TED Talks and audiobooks and other things at this point too. But the idea is that I realized that by documenting my process, by going through this process, I could leave a trail of breadcrumbs for those who are looking to uh, follow suit, for those who are looking to learn how to use a camera or to build a business or to essentially go down a similar path. So what ended up happening, um, as that first camera broke and I realized the importance of that camera or the importance of how, um, how it became my best friend essentially in my journeys because it was the only thing that I had, I was traveling alone. Uh, when I came back and I bought the gear and I started filming and creating stories, I started realizing that I was gaining attention for those stories. I would put them out on YouTube and then like, it would go, it would move. And this one moment, I, I went in, I ended up at Occupy Montreal. And um, the Occupy movement was gaining momentum and, and here in Montreal had a strong showing. And I'm there and I see one of my good friends, his, his name is Lawrence, but at the time I didn't really know him. We went to the same high school, but we were in different grades. And uh, I'm there and he's like, what are you doing here? And I was just there filming. I had like this like shoulder mount rig thing and I had a Canon 6D, 60D, sorry which is a good camera at the time. And I was like so stoked and had a little shotgun mic and everything. And, uh, and I was just filming and he's like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm just looking for the story. I'm trying to tell the story of Occupy. And he 
was like, well, well, wait a second. Are you a journalist? Like, do you work for, you know, a newspaper or something? And I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm just here to document. I'm just here to figure out what the story is. And as we're having that conversation, shit you not, David Suzuki just pops up. And for those of you who don't know who David Suzuki is, he is a, a kind of a famous environmentalist. He's in, particularly here in Canada. He's done amazing work around the globe, but particularly out west. Um, and I won't go into too into much into the story, but the idea is, so David Suzuki's there and I run up to him, I'm like, that's David Suzuki. And I run up to him and, and Lawrence follows and I film this quick little interview. I'm getting his thoughts on occupying what's going on. And he gives me this passionate rant. And it was the first time that I realized, wow, David Suzuki's job is to be an influencer, to be a storyteller. And he told the story of what was happening in the cultural narrative, in the movement of Occupy and what it meant and what it was expressing as a culture at that time and our frustrations with that cult, with their culture at that time. And so I go home and I, I, I edit the video and this is like one of my first ever videos. I mean, literally the first ever video I, I created was my grandmother's recipes of, of, her, of, her, of her work. But this is one of the first ever videos that I'm, I'm creating and uploading online. And so I upload this video and like within a short period of time, I think it got like 50,000 views, which in my world was like viral. Like I was like, oh my, like, like what is happening, right? And I was so excited. And I, I got so excited that I ended up going to occupy Wall Street. I literally went to New York with Lawrence and, and it inspired me. So I filmed there and then I get an interview with Don King. And then I met, you know, one of these people who I'd been watching um, from uh, We Are Change called Luke Rudkowski. And I was, because I was uh, into conspiracy theories at the time. So I started to realize just how much I loved content. And I went from being a content consumer to a content creator in that moment. And I started to tell that story. And I documented everywhere I was going and I just became obsessed. Like absolutely obsessed with documenting this movement to the point where when I came back to Montreal, I decided I was gonna start a movement. I decided I was gonna go out in the middle of a GMO corn and soy field, plant a tree and build a school I wish I could have gone to both physically and digitally. And how I was gonna do it was that I was gonna go out into that field and I was gonna bust out my camera and my phone and I was going to literally just express what was happening. What was happening in the cultural movement around me? What was happening in every single moment of what I was doing and creating? And so planting that tree out in the middle of the GMO cornfield was, was kind of me making a statement that I was going to build the community that I, that I I wanted and I wanted to be a part of, but pulling out the phone and, and t taking out my camera and literally like footage of the first time that we were ever on the land, like showing it barren completely with nothing. And then to see what it looks like today, it's just, it's incredible. I literally became a, a documentary maker. I became a storyteller and, um, and I didn't realize it, but, but through that moment, through this camera, it, it, it empowered me further and further and further. Everything I know about marketing, everything I know about running an agency, all the ways that I've, I've made money and been able to buy all this gear and, and amass so much knowledge of what makes a really good story and how it goes viral. And the reasons I've been able to reach millions and millions of people online is because I've understood the fundamental principles of storytelling and the power that it yields in our culture. And I believe that we are only at the beginning of this, of this narrative shift because now anybody with a camera can be a storyteller. You know, you don't have to have hundreds of millions of dollars and it's, and it's not about the gear, even though I'm obsessed with it. It's the thing I spend the most amount of time and energy on. It wasn't about that. It, it's about the story because most viral videos are, aren't planned. They just, they just happen. Kind of like that David Suzuki moment, right? Kind of like a cat meme or a, or a, a fail video on YouTube. Um, and, and at the same time, some of them do, right? I, I've, I know that I've been a massive fan of people like Casey Neistat and Joe Rogan for the longest time, watching hours and hours and hours, listening to podcast after podcast after podcast of somebody like Joe Rogan interview some of the, the most amazing people on the planet. Um, 
and inspire me consistently and, and, and it inspires me, you know, it's one of my impossibilist dreams to, to be on Joe Rogan's show. It's one of my dreams to create a vlog and to do this stuff. And I've struggled, honestly. Um, I've had the biggest struggle in my life trying to consistently tell a story and realize that I can, if I can move from the process of documenting to, to literally processing that footage, realizing the stories behind it, and then putting it out and disseminating and distributing those stories, that that is a, a very intensive process. And so I became good at telling stories. I understood how to shoot stories, but I, I was kind of missing the piece in the middle of processing that story and really building that, that team around me. Um, but now that's changed. Now that's really started to shift and, and change and it's because I'm creating this space around me. I'm literally building a story laboratory here in, in, my, in my childhood home, in my parents' basement. You know, They've gone on to, to go move out and do all sorts of things and now this has kind of become my space. My brother's left and, and I wanna replace um, this space that I grew up in, the, the space where I used to play video games and, and kind of be a content, um, consumer into being a content creator. And so this whole, this whole story arc has, has led me to wanting to create um, what I'm now calling the story story. And so, um, well, this is it. If you made it to this part of the video, you voted with your attention and I appreciate you. Thank you so much for taking the time to participate, for viewing this video. If you vote with your attention by liking, commenting, sharing, realizing that we pay attention to this, that if, if I said something that angered you or if I said something that inspired you, let me know in the comments because I cannot wait to have this conversation with you. So go make that happen. Click those buttons. <laughs>